So, oh yeah, prove it. Uh, I want to show some practical examples of that. I'll be honest. So th this is an outline. Let me preface with this. This is an outline written by Pastor Randy. Um, and as we've heard from other ministers who have used his outlines, they're not very expounded upon. So uh, he gave me some of the main scriptures, like one main point, and the rest was up to me. So <laughs> I pray that it comes across great. And now... I wanted to come up with examples because when I heard proving was the title of the message, I, I didn't like jump at that. It wasn't like, oh yes, I've always wanted to teach a message on proving. Like, what does that even mean? Like, I don't, I didn't know at the time, okay? So through research and examples, we're gonna take a look at that to help you have a better understanding of proving being found faithful. So you'll hear this when kids are on the playground, you know, they're swinging from the monkey bars and they're like, I bet I can go across skipping every other monkey bar. And all the other kids are like, oh yeah, prove it. Because they, they don't want to be outdone because they're like, well, I bet I can go across only touching three of the bars. Oh yeah, prove it. So that's, that's a good practical example of someone challenging you to prove it. Another example of proof is a proof of purchase, a, a receipt. You know, if you go to the Sam's Club in order to get out of the building, you know, they check your receipt. They need to see the proof of purchase because, you know, they don't use bags there. You just fill the cart and then scan it and walk out. Kind of seems wrong. But uh, they check the receipt to make sure that you're not just filling the cart and walking out. So it's a proof of a purchase. You have evidence that you purchased those items. Another example of proving is an art proof. You know, if you're getting something customized like a trophy or a mug or a t-shirt, that company, if they're a reputable company, should send you a proof of what the artwork is going to look like on their product. So you know exactly what you're getting. You know, the font isn't going to be all jammed up or smudgy or whatever. You know, you want to see a proof to make sure that it's a quality product, right? So what is proving? Uh, according to the real dictionary, uh, proving demonstrates the truth or existence of something by evidence or arguments. So you're demonstrating the existence of something. You are proving that that thing exists. Another definition that I came across was subject to a testing process. Proving means that something is subject to a testing process. It goes through several stages of development and testing before that thing or that product is released. My version, the Jason Scott Gregg's version of proving, based on these definitions, are actions that verify claims. Actions that verify claims. Now, a couple of synonyms for proving. We're just laying a foundation here, so, so bear with me. Synonyms for proving are confirm, to demonstrate, to justify, to validate, to show, or evidence. So write this down if you're taking notes. Proof is evidence. Proof is evidence. So now that we have like a little bit of a better definition of what is proving, I have a few more examples here. And I just want this to stick, because like I said, when I first read proving, it didn't jump out at me, I didn't have a full understanding of what that meant. So I'm helping you gain an understanding of what proving is before we continue. So another example would be like if you're taking a math test, or maybe you're helping your children or your grandchildren with their math homework, and you know, they've changed math, so... Who knows if it's done the same way that it was when you went through school. But they always ask you to, you know, here's the problem, whatever it's asking for, show your answer, prove your work. So the kids won't get credit on that test problem if they just write down an answer. They, the teacher is looking for not that you know the right answer, but how you can get to the right answer. They want to know that you understand the steps and the processes involved in getting to that answer. So prove your work. And then the, the last example that I have for now is innocent until proven guilty. 
So what proves or disproves you guilty is the evidence. When you're sitting in the courtroom, they've got to present evidence as to whether or not you did the crime. And then the jury, strictly using the evidence, it can't be based on biased opinions or what they think is right, or not even their own moral standards, but they have to use the evidence that was presented to come up with whether or not that person is guilty or not guilty. So they have to prove it using the evidence. So this goes hand in hand with what we're talking about, uh, being found faithful. So we're going to look at a couple of scriptures here that talk about being found faithful. What does faithfulness have to do with proving? You have to prove yourself faithful. You're not just faithful just because you say that you're faithful. You have to prove that you're faithful. So let's look at the word of God. Luke chapter 16, verse 10. Luke 16, 10. Give me a shout or something when you're there. All right. Luke 16. Yeah, Luke 16, 10. He that is faithful in that which is least, or in the small things, is faithful also in much. And he that is unjust or not faithful in the small things is also not faithful in much. Therefore, if ye have not been faithful in the unrighteous things, who will commit to your trust the true riches or the kingdom of God? And if you have not been faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give you that which is your own? How can you be trusted with something that you own if you won't even take care of something that belongs to somebody else? If you don't have the respect of somebody else's property or things that are important to other people, why would you respect the things that belong to you? Because we see a principle in the word that you love others as you love yourself or do unto others as you would have done unto you, right? So you're not going to take care of, if you don't love yourself, you're not going to love others. If you don't take care of your own things, certainly not going to take care of other people's things and therefore you're not going to get any more things. And it's not just things. We're talking about principles here, okay? Now let's look at another example. This is a story from the Bible that goes more into detail about this, this subject, being found faithful in little and being found faithful in much. Matthew, let's turn over to Matthew 25, ooh, 25 through 14. Sorry, 25 verse 14. Matthew 25, 14. Give me a holler when you're there. All right, y'all are quick. Are you sure you're there? I didn't even get there yet. Okay, Matthew 25. We're gonna start in verse 14. So bear with me as we read this story, but there's some profound things in here. You're all, most of you are probably familiar with this passage, so we'll read the bulk, and then we'll start to summarize. The kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country who called his servants and delivered unto them his goods. And unto one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one. So he's distributing his stuff while he's away. He's going on vacation, I guess. I don't know. He's going to do something else, and he needs somebody to watch his things. So he distributes it to these three different people in three different amounts. Each person is given something different. Okay? And unto one, I'm going to read this again. And unto one he gave five, to another two, and to another one. To every man according to his several ability. So we want to stop here. Most times people are quick to make this point about faithfulness later on in the story, about what the people did with these things. But we see an example of proof right here, or faithfulness. They were given these talents based on their ability. So up to this point in the story, they've proven themselves to be faithful, just in different ways. One, he knew that he could trust with the five talents because he had shown himself faithful Otherwise, he would not have given him the most talents, right? And then same with the the guy that had two. You know, he knew that he could be trusted with 
two things. So he gave him the two things. And then the guy that only got one, he was like, mm, you know, I don't fully trust you, but we're going to give this a shot. You haven't shown that you can handle the five or the two, but I'll give you one. Okay, so we're already seeing proof. These people have proven themselves as to what their ability is to manage their master's goods. And so the story continues. Straightway, he took his journey. Then while he was away, he that had received the five talents went and traded with the same and made them other five. So he got five more. Likewise, he that received two also gained other two. But he that had received one went and digged in the earth, and he hid his Lord's money. And after a long time, the Lord of those servants came to reckon with them. And so he that had received the five brought other five, saying, Lord, you delivered me five talents. Behold, I have gained you five more. That's faithful. His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of thy Lord. So he's going to get more. This was like a promotion. You know, the master saw that he could be trusted with these things, that he increased his good, he was a faithful servant, and now comes the promotion and the increase. Same thing happens with the guy that had two. He increased, got two more. The Lord was pleased with him. He said, good job, well done, enter into my joy. Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you were a hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown, and gathering where thou hast not strawed, and I was afraid, and went and hid thy talents in the earth. Lo, there's your talent back. Have it back. First, first of all, now he gives the Lord his money all dirty. He'd be done, put it in, the, in a hole in the ground. Could have at least put it like under the mattress. Anyway, that's not part of the message. So his Lord answered and said unto him, you wicked and lazy servant, you knew what I expected of you. Therefore, you should have done something with what I've given you. Therefore, take your talent and give it to the one which has 10. For unto everyone that hath shall be given and he shall have abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath. And cast that servant out. You know, he wasn't worthy of being with the master anymore because he wasn't faithful. This, this master was looking for somebody who was faithful, that could be trusted. He wanted to promote them. He readily promoted them based on their performance, not his performance. He wasn't basing it on how much he gave them. The one with the five and the one with the two got the same reward. So it wasn't based on what he gave them. It was what they gave him back, okay? So... A key point here is that this, they were found faithful in another man's. This was something that was given to them that did not belong to them. And then we read, according to his several ability, they were not given something that they could not handle. The result was up to them. So I pose the question to you tonight, what can you do with what you have been given? Okay? Now, these, these servants proved themselves in one way, or another. This particular aspect was in finances, uh, but we have several proving grounds in our life. It's not just with other people's money. Okay, so the term that the Lord gave me was proving grounds. We all have several proving grounds in our life. Areas that we can prove ourselves to be found faithful, just like these servants. So finances being one of them, we see that in the story of the talents. Your job 2 Thessalonians 3 says, Do everything as unto the Lord, not unto man, knowing that from the Lord you shall receive your reward. That sounds like the story we just read. Your gifts, you know, the things that God has placed on the inside of you, your talents, your, your ability, can you sing, can you dance, are you a good business person? You know, the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. He's expecting something from you. He's not going to take the gift back. He's looking for return. Uh, another proving ground is your family. 1 Timothy 3, 5 says, if you can't handle your own family, how can you handle the church of God? So your family is a proving ground. We're going to talk a little bit more about that. I, I want to say this now, and I'll probably say it again later on. I'll, I'll save it, actually. We're going to save that. Save that for later. And then another proving ground is your service 
to him, okay, in your worship, in your service to the Lord. And and looking at the children of Israel in the wilderness is a good example of this. So we're going to break this down a little bit. Uh, The children of Israel, they were redeemed from Egypt. The Lord brought them out of slavery and bondage of 430 years of being held captive. He's delivered them. He's brought them into this transitional period, okay? They're in their own proving ground, the wilderness. And so during this time, God gives them instructions. He tells them what to do, tells them what to expect, where they're going, how to get there, that he's going to provide for them. So in these instructions given by God, the point was to prove three things. Say three things. Just making sure you're still listening. The first thing was to prove that they were willing to obey and worship him. He called them out, not just so that they could have their own land or do their own thing. He called them out to see if they were willing and ready to obey and worship him. So they had to prove themselves. They had to prove that they were willing to worship him. After all, they were the ones that called out to him during that whole time they were in bondage. And the Lord said, I've heard the cries of my people. And then he begins talking to Moses to talk to Pharaoh to let them go. So they were crying out to God. So obviously they weren't totally disconnected from God. And now they're put into this area where they need to prove if what they were asking God to do is what they actually wanted. Now, they also needed to prove in this transition period that they were different from the nations around them. God just didn't just bring them out into the wilderness and treat them like everybody else. He gave them some pretty strict instructions on how to live their life, how to interact with other people, how to dress, how to eat, how to worship, how to serve him, how to walk, you know, who could worship him. It was a lot. Now, remember, we're under the new covenant, so we don't follow those same rules anymore, all right? But for them, they had to prove that they were different from the nations around them. So they had to do the proving in that area. But the third thing was that God was going to prove himself to them. God doesn't just ask us to prove ourselves and expect nothing from him. He wants to prove himself to us and to those around us, amen? So he was going to prove himself to them as they worshiped him and as they followed the commands that he, he gave them to do. Now, let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 4. And we're going to start in verse 1. 1 Corinthians 4, 1. Give me a holler when you're there. That was a little less, so... Y'all are still getting there. Okay. Well, I found that one first. All right. (laughs) 1 Corinthians 4, 1 through 2. So this is the Apostle Paul talking. They've established this church in Corinthia, uh, in Corinth, excuse me. And he says, Let a man account of us as the ministers of Christ. Look at our life. Examine the things that we've done take an account, keep a, keep a register of the things that we're doing as ministers of Christ and stewards of the mystery of God. They're revealing these new things. The church was fresh at this time. So the apostles are revealing these things to the churches that have been hidden since before the foundation of the world. And now they're being revealed and the apostles were trusted with, with revealing those things. Okay. Moreover, it is required, say required, not, it's not optional, it's not strongly recommended, it's not asked of you, it's required in a steward that a man be found faithful. So what, what does required mean? The definition of required is an action due from someone by virtue of their position. So the Jason Greggs version is Stewardship is expected from you because of your position in Christ. Stewardship is expected from you because of your position in Christ. And so I I began to meditate on that a little bit more, and that still wasn't cutting it for me. Like, that definition still wasn't hitting it for me. So as I prayed about that, 
this is what came up. A steward must prove himself because he's in a position to do so. You've been put on a pedestal. You know, you stepped out like the nation of Israel did. They stepped out and now everyone is watching. So it's required that you be found faithful. So it's interesting that we say you must step out in order to be found faithful. So like I said earlier, being found faithful isn't just a title or something that's given to you or just because, yes, I am, I am faithful. If someone were to define faithfulness, they would say me. Well, that's fine, but prove it, okay? There's no proof there just because you say it. You need to prove it, and that's what we're talking about. So we're gonna look at another scripture here, and before we get to that, the heading for this next scripture we're about to read in my Bible, you know, the little, some Bibles have them, some Bibles don't, some are different, but the one in my particular super giant, large print, mega edition Bible, you could probably read that from back there. Anyway, I digress. So the, the subtitle of this passage says, True Faith evidenced by works. True faith evidenced by works. Now, as we transition to the next part of this message, I want to point out to you that when we talk about works, it's not works to obtain righteousness. This isn't like religious traditions of men to claim that you're somebody that you know that you're not. Like you're not trying to earn a title, you're not trying to buy your way in or do things to make yourself clean, okay? Titus 3, 5 says, it's not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he has saved us. He did all the work, we accepted it, all right? So when we're talking about works, it's not works to obtain righteousness. And then Ephesians 2, 8, secures that, he says, not by works, lest any man should boast, but by grace, through faith, ye are saved. It was nothing but the grace of God that you were saved, okay? So it's nothing that you did. The only thing you did in this process was accept what he already did for you, okay? So it's not works to obtain righteousness, but it works it's works that come from a desire to do righteousness or from a lifestyle of righteousness now that you've been made righteous you're going to walk that out and you're going to act like you've been made the righteousness of God because that's what the word tells us that we've been made is the righteousness of God okay so now that we've established that you know when we talk about works it's not to obtain it's not to yeah, it's not to obtain righteousness. He's already done that. Let's look at James chapter 2, verse 14. James 2, 14. Shout uh, hallelujah when you're there. I said shout. Hallelujah. Okay. <laughs> it's, you know, it's Wednesday night. We had work today. You know, it's been a long day. So just stay with me, okay? Uh, James 2, 14. James 2, 14. Okay, we're going to take a look at this. What does it profit, my brothers, if a man say he has faith and does not have works? Can faith alone save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of food, they're starving, they have no clothes. And one of you says unto them, depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled. But you didn't do anything to meet those needs. What does it profit? Even so, faith, if it have not works, is dead being alone. Yes, a man may say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without works but I will show you my faith by my works. I'm going to prove that what I believe and what I say is true. Okay? You believe there's one God. That's fine, but the devils believe that also. So you can say all you want. 
I believe in God, I believe in God, I believe in Jesus, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe. But there's no proof. We need the proof of that. The devils sit back and say that we believe in God. It's doubtless to not deny, to, to deny God. Like, it's pointless to deny God. We all believe that God is out there. If nothing else, people in the world may say, well, there's a higher power. Okay, they're proving that there is something there, but there's no proof behind it. What are you doing to prove that? Okay. But will you know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? And we're going to see an example here. Was not Abraham our father, who was the father of faith, justified by works when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? See how faith wrought with his works, and by works his faith was made perfect. Abraham could have sat back in his tent when the Lord showed him all that was promised to him and said, I believe you. And God said, okay, that's great. Go and do something about it. And Abraham could have said, no, but I believe you. Okay, but you're not willing to take the first step to do what God has called you to do or to do what God has called you to be. You have to put action to what you're saying. Otherwise, it's just vain words. And that's why we're talking about proving. There needs to be proof. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So 1 Timothy 3, 8. 1 Timothy 3, 8. And we're going to look at this because in ministry or in our service to the Lord, people often say like, you know, I want to be the pastor of a church. Like, I want to have a huge congregation, I want to have a following, or I want to be a worship leader that puts out a multi-million dollar platinum Dove Awards record, right? They want these things, they desire these things, that's not a bad thing in and of themselves. But they don't do what's necessary to do to get there. They don't take the steps that are required to get to that goal. It could even be... So Spencer talked about this on Sunday night, you know, the, thought, the way that seems right to you. So first, we need to check to see if that even is a God idea. Once that's done, and then we prove that it is a God idea, then we need to put action to that and take steps towards that to do the things that need to be done. And this passage in Timothy is talking about that. Again, we see the Apostle Paul here. He's training and encouraging Timothy, who's a young man in the Lord. He's pastoring this church, and, you know, great and mighty things are happening. But he says in 1 Timothy 3, 8, likewise must the deacons, now don't get all spiritual, deacons in this passage is nothing more translated than servants. Not like a bowing and scraping type of servant or a slave, but a servant who wants to serve God and do what the Lord tells them to do because they know that it's a good thing and that they too will be rewarded for that, okay? So likewise must the deacons or the servants be grave, not double-tongued, not, so not hypocritical, not talking behind people's back, not given to much wine, not greedy of filthy lucre, you're not doing sketchy things on the side, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. Then here's, here's the, the ringer, okay? Verse 10, and let these also first, say first, be proved. First, be proved. Then, good job, then let them use the office of a deacon. So there's a proving process that must take place. There's a proving ground that you have to walk on first before you can use any office that the Lord God has called you to do. When we look back at the example of the talents, they had to go through a proving process first, then they were given the reward. So you can't just expect something for, for nothing. You need to put in the work in order to achieve the things that God has called you to do. And he wants to see if you're going to trust him with that. Like Katie talked about tonight with, with the tithe, you know, you have to put action to that. You have to give. If you say, Lord, bless me, bless me, bless me, bless me, bless me. What are you doing to prove that? You know, what are you doing to get to that point? You need to show him that you're willing to trust him so that he can bless you with even more. 
So there's a proving ground involved. So let them be proven first, then use the office. Now again, we talked about works a couple of minutes ago, but this proving is, this came up in my spirit too as I was preparing for this. You're not proving that you're worthy. When we talk about proving, you're not proving that you're worthy. Because let me put it out there right now, you're not worthy. I'm not worthy. None of us are worthy. But Jesus is worthy. And he made us worthy by what he did on the cross. And then, then after he made us worthy, he called us. And that, what, that's what qualifies us for these things that he's called us to. So we're not proving that we're worthy. What we are proving is that we're able to handle what has been given to us. We're not proving that we're worthy. We're proving that we're able to handle what has been given to us. So let's nix any idea, you know, when I said when I got up here, you know, the only way to grow and to succeed is by saying yes to the Lord when he calls you to these positions. And I, I'll be honest with you guys. My first instinct when the Lord presents opportunities to me is, what? Like, me? me? Like, I, I don't say that, like, I don't say that to be, like, that false humility. Like, oh, me? I'm shocked. Like, it's not out of a false humility. It's truly out of a place of, like, Lord, you picked me? Like, out of everyone you could have chosen? All of these people that are more qualified than me? all of these people that have titles on their names or have been studying the word of God for hours and hours on end, but you called me? That just, that just blows me. Like, that just blows me out of the water. So we're not proving that we're worthy because nothing that we ever do could ever be enough to prove that we're worthy. We're only proving that we're able to handle what he's been given to us. So I pose the question to you again. What have you been given? What are you doing with what has been given to you? Woo, Jesus. Somebody say amen. amen. Woo, hallelujah. So let's look at an example. I'm all about examples. Like I want practical, hands-on, you, you know, show me. Show me the proof. The proof is in the pudding. So let's look at the proof of this. We're talking about first let them be proven, then let them use the office. There's a really great example of this in the book of Acts. And we're going to watch somebody go through this proving process from beginning to end. I'm not going to read the passages to you, but I'll give you a summarization of them, tell them where they are, tell you where they are so you can go back and look at this on your own. But we're going to look at Philip as he's known now, Philip the evangelist. We hear a lot about Philip in the scriptures. He's an awesome man of God, and some of the things that happened to him were just amazing. So in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 6 verse 1 through 5. Okay, go ahead and write this down first, then we'll talk about it. Acts 6, 1 through 5, Philip at the tables. This is a starting point. Acts 6, 1 through 5, Philip at the tables. So the church is just now starting. You know, thousands of people are being added to the church daily. The church is just growing and growing and growing and so these people that are just people, again, who weren't worthy, but Jesus made them worthy, Jesus trusted them with the church. He said, I'm giving all of this to you. Then he ascended into heaven, and it was in their hands. So the church is growing. They're trying to figure things out as they go. They want to follow God, but there's so many people, but we can't neglect the things that we, we need to do, like feeding the hungry and helping the poor and and all these things, but we need to get the word of God out, and there's so many people coming into the house of God, we're trying to figure out how to handle it all. So the Lord said to them, find me seven people that are full of wisdom and the Holy Ghost. And you'd think from those qualifications that he would say, and send them, and start the churches, and establish the Bible schools, and send them to shake the nations, 
but he says, let them wait the tables and feed the widows and organize the bread lines so that nobody goes hungry. So this is where we find Philip. Philip is one of these seven. So first, let's say he's already proven himself early on that he was full of wisdom and full of the Holy Ghost because that was the requirement for this job position. And so he met those standards and now we see Philip waiting the tables. So he was obedient to God. He said yes to the opportunity that was presented to him and then we kind of don't hear about Philip for a while. The important thing is he said yes to what God had called him to do. And he was proving that he was willing to be obedient. Next, we see at, in Acts 8, 5 through 8, Acts 8, 5 through 8, verse 29. And this is Philip in the field. So we see Philip. He's now ministering to people on the road. He hears the guy reading the word of God in his carriage, so he goes up, talks to him, gets the man saved, goes to baptize him, and when he baptizes the guy in the water and comes up, Philip is just translated to another town, another city. Like, that's miraculous, right? Has that ever happened to you? I mean, maybe it has. I wouldn't be surprised because God's the same yesterday, today, and forever, but we don't hear of that happening often. So mighty things are now happening to Philip. He's in the field. He's getting people saved. He's doing the works of God. And he said yes to that opportunity as well. So he's no longer waiting the tables. There's nothing wrong with waiting the tables, but Philip's not there anymore. He's been promoted. Now, let's fast forward. Acts 21. Woo, we got to go. Okay, Acts 21, verse 8 through 9. And this we're going to title Philip the Evangelist. In this passage, we see Philip standing up, preaching the word of God in front of thousands, if not millions of people, getting them saved. He's operating in the gifts of the Spirit. He's flowing and doing all these great and mighty things. But where did he start? Waiting the tables. He was found faithful in the little things and God was able to promote him each step of the way to bigger and bigger and bigger things. Now there's nothing wrong with any of those steps and if you find yourself waiting, if you find yourself right now that you're in the position of waiting the tables, don't look down on that. Look at it as an, as an opportunity presented to you from the Most High God to prove yourself faithful. And you determine when you move to the next level by how faithful you are. He's waiting for you to prove yourself and your faithfulness. Amen? All right. Um, we might come back to that. Okay. Next thing we're going to look at with being found faithful and proving ourselves is fruit. We hear a lot in the New Testament about bearing much fruit, right? That all goes back to being found faithful and proving so let's look at Luke 13, 6 through 9. Luke 13, 6 through 9. Say amen when you're there. Luke 13, 6 through 9. Okay. And he spake a parable unto them. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came and sought fruit thereon, and he found none. Then he said unto the gardener of his vineyard, Behold, for three years I have come seeking fruit on this tree, and I have found none. Cut it down. Why is it wasting space and taking up ground? But the gardener said unto him, Lord, let it alone one more year. I'm going to dig around it, fertilize this tree, and if it bear fruit, great. If not, then cut it down. So we're, we see an example of mercy here. This uh, tree, which could be symbolic of you, has been given many opportunities to prove itself as a fig tree, but it has not done so. There was no figs on this tree, and the master was saying, you know, get it out of here. And the gardener said, wait, let's give it one more chance. We're going to cultivate it a little bit, and then we'll come back to see if there is fruit. This is uh, what Jesus talks about earlier in the book of Luke, where he says, bring forth fruits of repentance. 
God is looking for fruit. But I want to point out that if you're not here to bear fruit, why are you here? As the master said, why is this tree taking up ground in my garden? So why, if you're not bearing fruit, if there's not evidence in your life that, you, that what you say is true, that you're doing what you say that you believe that you need to do, where's the fruit? Where is the evidence? Where is the proof? So fruit in the scriptures is proof. When you see fruit in the scriptures, that means something has been done to bring that forth. It's proving that the process has worked. Fruit is the evidence and the characteristics of a tree. I'm not an avid gardener, maybe some of you are, but if I were to see a lemon tree without lemons, I would not know that that's a lemon tree. How I know that it's a lemon tree is when I see lemons on it, right? So the, the fruit of the tree proves the nature and characteristics of that type of the tree. And fruit in our life is no different. Fruit is the evidence of the characteristics of a person. Jesus said in John, my father is glorified when you bear much fruit. My father is glorified when you have proof in your life that you've trusted in me, followed my word, and are now receiving the benefit and the reward of that. And then he talks about, you know, the good tree brings forth good fruit. The bad tree brings forth bad fruit. And then as we see in this passage, some trees don't bring forth any fruit. Okay? So it's not the quantity of the fruit, but it's if fruit is is there. He didn't say when he comes back to the tree, the whole thing had to be full of fruit. He just wanted one fig from that tree, and that was going to be enough to save it from being taken out of the ground. So when it comes to proving, he's not looking for perfection. You're not proving that you're perfect. That goes back to, again, you're not proving that you're worthy, and you're not proving that you're perfect either. What he's looking for, he's looking at the heart, the thoughts, the intents, and the motives. Hebrews 4, 8 says, The word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, dividing to the asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrows, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of man. He's looking at the thoughts and the intents, the motives and the heart, and then we see in Samuel, when they're picking the next king for Israel, he goes through all of David's brothers, and you know, Samuel's looking at, well, this one's really strong, and this one can hunt good, and this one, and God says, stop. I'm not looking at the outward man, I'm looking at the heart. So God desires that we continually improve. Notice the root word of improve, prove. To improve is a change demonstrated over a period of time. Specifically, growth demonstrated over a period of time. And uh, I won't read the scripture to you, but Philippians 2.14, Paul says, you know, I haven't met the mark. Like I'm, I'm, and I'm not even going to reach the mark, but I continually press forward towards the mark of the prize of the high calling of God. So improvement there, we're always improving. Fruit is going to come as we improve. Now the last few minutes, I wanna talk about something that, uh, this was one of the very first things that came to mind when I got this outline and saw proving. Um, me and my wife watched the Great British Bake Off show. Does any, do any of you watch that? Oh, well, it's a great show. I saw like two hands. So if you're looking for something to watch, there you go. So anyway, they go through like each week they bake something different. So they'll have like cake week or pa uh, pastry week or you know, all these things. And then one week they have bread week. Now bread week, all of the bakers on the show are like, oh my gosh, it's bread week. Like I'm so like, this is my worst one. I'm so nervous. Like why is that? Because when you're baking bread, there's a process that's more involved than when you bake other things. And that's called the proving process, or proofing. The two are interchangeable. So during this proving process, like on the show, they have to come in the night before to make the dough. So then on the day of the bread day competition, the dough is ready, and that the dough has been proved. So they're able to move to the next step. 
So what is the proving process? When you prove dough, it's allowing time for the yeast to show that it's working correctly or doing what it is supposed to do before you move to the next step. So the bread has, the dough has to rise, it has to get its stability, it's got to get sturdy enough so that you can shape it and mold it and it won't fall apart. So that got me thinking, sometimes the bakers on the show are freaking out the day of bread day because they're like, oh no, my dough failed. Or they'll say, my dough didn't prove. So that got me thinking, well, what is... Like, what, why is that such a big deal? You know, you still have dough. It looks doughy to me. If I saw that, like, I wouldn't know the difference. So here's some reasons why a dough that you're making, like a bread dough, would fail. And this is really important. This just struck me. This is why I was up till 1230 last night, because I was looking up bread. <laughs> so... Reasons why bread dough would fail. The yeast is no longer active. Sounds like there was no works to the faith. Another reason is the climate conditions or the environment around you. Another reason would be too much liquid in the dough. There's not enough meat. You're still in the the milk of the word or not in the word, actually. Being in the milk of the word is great. That's a first step to proving, right, that you're a student of the word. But if you're not in the word, so another reason is the wrong type or amount of yeast. We talked about this at the ministerial fellowship last weekend. What are your motives? Why are you doing what, are you, what you're doing? The type or the amount of yeast? This one, just not adding or using too little salt will cause the dough to fail, will cause the bread dough not to prove. James talked about this Sunday morning. Pastor talked about it the week before. We are the salt of the earth. If the salt loses his savor, how how can he get it back? It's good for nothing. Another reason why dough would fail is insufficient baking time. Are you rushing the process? Do you want to get to the last step so badly that you're willing to forego all the steps in between to get there? Your dough is going to fail. You're not going to be ready for the next step. And then the last one is wrong oven temperature and wrong type of flour. What's influencing you? What have you allowed in? So let's look at one last scripture verse, and this was a short one, but it's 2 Corinthians 13. This is the last thing. 2 Corinthians 13, 5. He says, examine yourselves. This is an introspective process. Nobody else can do it for you, There is evidence on the outside that maybe things aren't right on the inside, but you have to examine yourselves, whether you're in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except you be retrobates, like you're in the world. So you need to stop and check to see if you're still in the faith, and if so, Prove it. It's time to demonstrate, to show it, to bring evidence, to bring forth proof that you are who you say you are, that you are walking in the word of God. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Well, that's all I've got for you. Let's go ahead and stand up to our feet. You know, those, those steps of why the dough would fail, like I said, that just blew me out of the water. Like, that was amazing to me because it's so, it's so practical. You know, what are you allowing in? What are the influences on you? You know, what is your climate like? Who are you hanging out with? Who are you around? 
What are you allowing into your life that's causing you to be stunted in your growth and development or stunting you from going to the next step or even just being ready for the next step? So we're gonna examine ourselves tonight. We talked about this on the youth retreat a couple of weeks ago. The theme was uh, search. And we had this little saying, search me God, know my heart, make me clean every part, lead me God in your way each and every day. So we have to examine ourselves. Is there proof in your life that you are a servant of the Most High God? Is there proof in your life that you're improving, that you're growing, that you're developing, that you're changing, that you're not being stagnant? Is there proof in your life that proves that you're doing what you say that you believe? It's easy to say stuff, right? I can jump over the monkey bars. Oh yeah, prove it. And all eyes turn to you because they want to see that you can do what you say you can do, right? Because the world is so quick to hold you to the flame. Well, you said that you served God. Why did he let this happen? Why is he doing these things to me? Why is he doing these things to you? That's what the world says. They want proof. And you need to be able to stand before them and say, I serve the living God. Here's the fruit of my life. No matter what it looks like, I'm walking in healing. I'm walking in deliverance. I'm walking in prosperity. I'm walking in the victory that my God already paid for me to have. It's not about being worthy. It's about proving that you're able to handle what's been given to you. So examine yourself tonight. Is there enough proof in your life to convict you of being guilty of serving the Lord? Just think about that. Again, the scripture said, examine your own selves. I can't do it for you. There may be proof in your life that you're not doing that, but you've got to do it for yourself, amen? amen. So I'm, I'm going to go ahead and pray. Everybody just lift your hands all across this room tonight. I'm not going to do an altar call necessarily, but I'm just going to make a prayer and a confession, and uh, you can agree with me, use your faith to agree, or you can not. That's up to you. So Lord, we come before you tonight in the mighty name of Jesus. We're so thankful, Father, for all the opportunities that you've presented to us. And Father, these opportunities aren't only so that we can be blessed or, and move forward in life, but they're to prove ourselves and they're to prove that you are who you say that you are. Father, I pray for each person in this room that they would step out tonight in faith, active in the word of God, letting their faith be evidenced by works, not of their own hands, not works of righteousness, but in acts of faith and in trust to you, Father. I pray, Lord, that there would be much fruit in their lives. Show them the areas, Father, that they need to change, that they need to cleanse, that they need to cut off, so that they can prove themselves, so that their dough can rise, so that they can be ready for the next step and the next stage of development. Thank you, Lord. We honor you tonight as head of the church, as head of our lives, and we thank you when we praise you. Now I want to offer this opportunity for anybody in the room who's not saved. Maybe you say, I have no idea what you're talking about. I just came in here off the street, or I'm not really into the word. I'm only here because my grandma was saved, or whatever. Uh, and you've never had a personal relationship with Jesus, I want to offer that to you tonight. It's a real simple prayer. He says, all you have to do is confess with your mouth and believe with your heart, and you shall be saved. So we're going to do that tonight. So all hands raised across this room. Say this with me. Heavenly Father, I believe your word is true. You sent Jesus, your only son, to die for me, to cleanse me, to make me a new creature. I believe that he rose again and he's now in heaven, seated with you, looking down at me, ready for what he has next in my life. I call myself by the name of Jesus, a Christian, a new creature in Christ Jesus.